So, we've uh, looked at several things so far in terms of peaks and diffraction patterns. Uh, we've looked at the position and how that's determined by unit cell shape and size. And we've looked at peak intensity um, and peak multiplicity as well, which um, tie into the number of peaks that we see and also uh, their intensity. So uh, form factors, volume of fraction of a given phase um, and, and so on. Uh, but what about the shape of peaks? This is something that we've not really looked at so far. We often hear, we can see in the example on the right hand side here, we often hear um, people talking about peak shapes in terms of beta parameters or the full width at half maximum FWHM. Um, but peak shapes generally in diffraction terms we can use those, that's fine. We also often hear of uh, peak shapes being talked about being uh, Gaussian or Lorentzian. You can see two examples here. Um, the two peaks, the Gaussian and Lorentzian peaks we see here, both have the same area, but you can see the Lorentzian has much more contribution from the tails of the peak, whereas the Gaussian is much more focused into the, uh, into the central intensity. Often we actually talk about diffraction peaks as being a, a pseudo void shape, which is a combination of both of these effects, Gaussian and Lorentzian. And of course they may also be asymmetric as well, so we may have some asymmetry in, in the peak shape as well. The factors that affect peak shape uh, tend to be um, characterized in two ways. Uh, instrumental, which is more likely to be Gaussian effects, and sample related, um, which are more often Lorentzian type effects. Okay, so we've looked at um, instrumental setups before. Um, there are various instrumental influences on the peak shape, the width of the, the x-ray source, the, 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 the size of it, um, the optics that you have in the machine, the, the receiving slit width in particular, um, right in front of the detector, that's going to have a big impact on the resolution of the diffractometer. Um, We've talked about horizontal divergence before, this kind of flat plane specimen error, the fact that we don't have a, a sample that sits perfectly on the diffraction circle. Um, we've mentioned solar slits in the, in the past as well, um, and the effect that this can have on axial divergence, and so that's given as a, an asymmetry on the lower angle side of our peaks if we're not careful. Um, defocusing, you know, if they put the slits in the wrong place, or we've got some asymmetry from the reflection condition, this can give us some broadening, some asymmetry. Um, but these should be effectively constant and characteristic for a diffractometer. So we're, if we're not changing the setup of the machine, these factors should always be the same. So you should at least be able to compare like with like, so to speak. There are three main sample related factors and obviously these are gonna vary much more from sample to sample that goes into the machine. Uh, the three main effects are sample transparency, crystallite size, and microstrain. And we'll look at each of these in turn. Sample transparency occurs with samples where there's a, uh, they've got a low absorption coefficient. So they're made up with, particularly with X-ray diffraction if the samples are organics or have lots of light elements, um, then this may be a problem. So the X-rays here, because the sample's not absorbing so heavily, uh, the X-rays can penetrate significantly below the actual physical surface of the specimen. The result is that uh, the scattering surface effectively lies below the physical surface. And you can see that drawn in the schematic at the bottom. What that gives you is an effective displacement away from the diffraction circle. And so we tend to see an asymmetry on the low angle side because the, the, a good proportion of the sample is effectively too low. Um, so it's a, kind of like a, a specimen height displacement error um, in, in, uh, that is giving you that so a shift to a lower angle or a, a, an asymmetry on the lower angle side of peaks. Best way of avoiding this, if it is a problem, maybe mount your sample on a glass slide with a little bit of Vaseline and, and then just sprinkle some powder on top. So keep the sample very thin uh, to minimize the effect. Uh, microstructure effects um, tend to be much more of an issue. Uh, if you've got reflections from crystallites that are less than about a micron, maybe a tenth of a micron, or where the crystal lattice is very strained, um, then you'll get broadening of the of the XRD lines, so they'll, they'll be broader than they, they would be otherwise. <clears throat> it's important to note at this stage, actually, when we talk about crystallite size from X-ray diffraction data, it's not the same as particle size. Uh, we cannot measure particle size by XRD. What we measure is the crystallite size, 
uh, or even more properly, probably the, the coherent scattering domain size. Um, so what's given us coherent scattering. This is a really important field because chemical properties often depend on crystallite size. If you take gold at um, you know one micron particle size, it will uh, have a melting point of about 1066 degrees C. If you make nanoparticles of gold, they'll melt much lower, maybe 300, 400 degrees C. So kind of a dramatic input onto the uh, onto the chemical properties. So it takes a, it took me a while to get my head around where this um, broadening from crystallite size um, has its origin. The best way to describe it for me is is as follows: If we imagine we're defining Bragg's law, remember that from a previous video on peak position. Uh, we said that diffraction is a, the effect of complete constructive interference and it occurs when the path length difference between adjacent planes is exactly equal to an integer number of wavelengths. So if you imagine we've got x-ray 1 coming in to hit our crystal here at point 0 um, and then diffracts off at uh, some angle theta to uh, 1 prime. If we have a second x-ray for that to be in phase and to give us constructive interference, it's going to have to travel an extra distance A, B, C. And we've seen before when defining Bragg's law that that distance must be uh, 1 lambda, uh, an integer number of wavelengths. Simple geometry means that if we go to the next plane down, the distance, uh, the path length different distance is now going to be DEF. That must therefore be 2 lambda. If A, B, C equals 1 lambda, DEF must equal 2 lambda. If we, however, set theta to be half a uh, wavelength, um, then the distance DEF will be one wavelength. And what we'll get now is complete destructive interference. Um, so the planes are cancelling out each other's scattering. Now imagine we set the incidence angle theta to be 1.1 lambda. So it's about 110% uh, of, the, of the wavelength. The distance DEF will now be 2.2 uh, times lambda. And if we look at the, the sixth plane down, uh, the scattered waves will be um, at 5.5 lambda. That means the scattering from that sixth plane will be exactly half a wavelength out of phase with that from the first plane. The scattering from the second plane will be out of phase with that from the seventh and so on. So if you consider all the planes and all the unit cells in the crystal, we wouldn't see any net scattering. What that means is it's kind of intuitive, really, when you think about it. When we're not at the Bragg angle, we don't see a peak. So basically, we've defined the opposite of the Bragg condition. However, if we set theta to be a lot closer to the Bragg angle, for example, set an ABC to equal 1.001 wavelengths, the scattering from the first plane is going to be cancelled out from this uh, scattering from the plane 501 layers down into the crystal. So we're still getting that complete destructive interference when we're away from the Bragg angle. If ABC is 1.00001 times the wavelength, the scattering would be cancelled out by the 50,000 and first plane, and so on. Now in a big crystallite, that's fine. We'd still see complete destructive interference away from the Bragg angle, and so we still only see our, Bragg, our nice sharp uh, reflections where we are meeting the Bragg condition um, when that distance ABC is equal to one wavelength. But what about if you're looking at a really small crystallite? If the crystallite size is smaller than certainly one micron, maybe uh, 0.1 of a micron, the planes you need to cancel scattering from the first plane, or I'd say wavelength of 1.0001 wavelengths, that 5,000 and first plane down into the crystallite might not actually be there. And so the condition for the total destructive interference starts to break down. The diffraction peak begins to broaden. This crystallite broadening can be related to the crystallite dimension, tau, um, via the Scherer equation that you can see on the right-hand side here. And so beta, the broadening, is something that we can measure by measuring the full width half maximum or the area of the peak or, or so on. The broadening beta um, can be put into that equation and we can work out exactly what the crystallite size is. We also need to bear in mind the instrument itself will be given as a finite width to the peaks and so we should run some standard with a peak uh, close to the peaks that we're looking at in our sample. Preferably we would use as a standard uh, 
the same composition but without the broadening, but that's not always possible. Um, but we would run some sort of standard with peaks nearby and look at the peak shape, get a beta value for the broadening of those and subtract that away from ours. So we're subtracting the instrumental effect um, before we work out our broadening from our sample. And that's very straightforward. Uh, for microstrain, um, there are a number of different uh, um, contributions, uh, lattice distortions, dislocations, and, and so on, faults in the, in the crystal structure. Um, you can see the equation at the bottom here. It's usually given as uh, b as a function of 2 theta equal to 4 times epsilon, where epsilon is the microstrain coefficient, multiplied by sine theta over cos theta. Anyone that knows me will know that my maths is terrible, but I'm pretty sure that sine theta over cos theta is just equal to tan theta. So we can simplify the equation as seen here. Um, so if you look at this, we've obviously got a, a, an angle dependence um, on the broadening. So this is why it's important if we're running standards to look at microstrain and crystallite size as well. Um, it's, that's why it's important that the peaks be close to our observed peaks with the broadening we want to study. Um, but it's very easy, as you can see from these equations, to work out crystallite size or microstrain from X-ray diffraction data. In a separate material, this is available elsewhere on the on the website here. But we'll go through uh, how we would actually achieve this in terms of software or, or doing it manually. Um, but hopefully, this has been useful in giving you a theoretical overview of the uh, principles involved.